Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Indigenous elders past and present. First up today, I'd like to thank you all heartily for coming out on such a rotten day. It's uh, cold, it's bitter, storms and hail are predicted, but as I walked across from my office, the sun was out, so at least that's something. But uh, thank you for making the effort today, and I'm sure you'll be very pleased that, that you have, have done so, because our sp speaker today is Dr. Bede Harris, who is a senior lecturer in law at uh, Charles Sturt University. And uh, his topic, is that better now? I, I think something has just... It still needs a bit more. Still needs a bit more? Well, well, perhaps I'll bend my knees and speak up a bit. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> and uh, um, we'll, we'll proceed. So Dr. Harris is Senior Lecturer in Law at Charles Sturt University. He has uh, lots of interests, but most recently he's been writing about uh, constitutional change and uh, noting the difficulty of, of changing the constitution in Australia. He's going to talk to us about some ideas that I'm sure we will all find provocative and uh, stimulating. So to talk about does our constitution really give effect to the doctrines it purportedly embodies, an argument in favour of constitutional reform, I'd like you please to welcome Dr. Bede Harris. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to present this paper. The research we do is inevitably affected by our life experience. I grew up in what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and did my law degree in South Africa, where I began teaching constitutional law. Both countries were in the midst of conflict over their constitutional futures, and debate on constitutional change was the norm, not only among politicians, but in social life as well, and at all levels of society. I subsequently taught in New Zealand for five years, in the wake of the reformist tenure of Prime Minister Sir Geoffrey Palmer, which had seen the enactment of the Constitution Act of 1986, and was followed by the enactment of a statutory Bill of Rights and the adoption of a proportional representation system. I moved to Australia in 1997. In contrast to Southern Africa and New Zealand, constitutional debate in Australia, and here I'm referring to debate on systemic fundamental change, has been striking by its absence. So what I'm going to do today is take the license, which I hope I'm allowed, as someone who was originally an outsider, but who has taught and researched constitutional law in Australia for 19 years, to cast a critical eye over our institutions from the perspective of pure theory, taking an ahistoric blank sheet approach and asking if we could redesign the Commonwealth Constitution, how would we do it and what would we adopt from other jurisdictions? I also approach this task from the position of the academic who has the luxury, in fact, I would emphatically say the duty of discussing reform without regard to how such reforms might be achieved, a question which lies in the province of political actors. I do, however, offer some thoughts on the issues of political practicality at the end of this paper. I'm going to discuss reforms in five key areas, parliamentary representation, parliamentary control over the executive, rights protection, federalism and the republic, the latter including codification of the reserved powers. I conclude with a discussion of the practicalities of reform and of the pressing need to enhance civics education. First, as to representation, the quality of an electoral system must be measured by the extent to which it fulfills its purpose in a democracy, which is surely to produce results which accurately reflect the views of the voting population. One can thus say that an electoral system is democratic to a greater or lesser extent, depending on how representative it is. Applying this criterion to the system for elections for the House of Representatives contained in the Commonwealth Electoral Act, one can say that while falling within the spectrum of democratic systems, it falls far short of giving equal effect 
to every citizen's vote. It is nothing novel to state that the single member electorate system is the most distorting available when compared to the range of systems on offer. The key factor in determining how many seats a party obtains is not the number of votes it obtains nationwide, but rather the accident of where voters happen to live relative to electoral boundaries. Furthermore, this arbitrary system, one, always leads to parties receiving a different percentage of seats to that which their percentage share of the nationwide vote entitles them to. Two, frequently leads to a party winning government without obtaining a majority of first preference votes. And three, sometimes even leads to a government winning a majority of seats with fewer votes than the major opposition party, as happened in 1954, 1961, 69, 90, and 98. So to take some examples from recent elections, while just under 13 million votes were cast in the 2007 election, the outcome was effectively decided by 8,772 voters in 11 electorates, who, if they'd given their first preference to the coalition instead of to Labour, would have handed victory to the former. And this an, in an election which the allocation of seats in Parliament, 83 to Labour and 65 to the coalition, gave the appearance of a Labour landslide. In 2010, the margin was even closer. Just over 13 million votes were cast, but had just 2,175 voters in two electorates voted for the coalition instead of for Labour, the coalition would have won power, assuming that the minor parties and independents voted, uh, uh, made the same choices as to who to support. How can an electoral system possibly be considered representative of voter sentiment when the winning of government depends upon the arbitrary fact of the geographical location of a tiny number of votes? Another result of systems using single member electorates is that they inevitably lead to a never ending transfer in power between two parties and thus the establishment of a duopoly in place of a democracy. A reflection of popular dissatisfaction with this state of affairs is the fact that an ever increasing number of voters are expressing their frustration with the major parties by directing their first preference votes to parties other than Labour or the Coalition. In the 2007 election, 14.5% of first preference votes went to minor parties or independents, but this increased to 18.2% in 2010 and to 21% in 2013. And this is despite the fact that a first preference vote cast for other than one of the two major political blocs amounts in almost all instances to nothing more than a gesture to be made before having to make a reluctant choice between the parties which can actually win a seat but with which the voter may have no affinity whatsoever. I would therefore argue that we should adopt a system of proportional representation of which I would suggest that the single transferable vote system with its multi-member electorates best balances the requirements of overall proportionality and voter control over the identity of representatives. This system has the advantage of already being used in the ACT and Tasmania it is also used in countries such as Ireland and Malta. The key determinant of how representative are the results produced by this system is how many members are allocated to each electorate. A comparative analysis of election results from jurisdictions using STV indicates that one can state with a high degree of confidence that if we had a system where each electorate returned at least seven members to parliament, the possibility of a government coming to power with a minority of nationwide votes would be negligible. And of course, you'd get even greater representation if you had a larger number of members per seat. If this system was adopted, constitutional amendment would be required as proportionality would be compromised unless the boundaries of the multi-member electorates could be drawn without regard to state boundaries, which would currently fall foul of section 29 of the constitution. I would also recommend that the size of the House of, the Rep of Representatives be increased, both in order to keep the new electorates to manageable size and in order to reduce the ratio between voters and their elected representatives, which is currently significantly higher in Australia than is the case in comparable democracies. Of course, 
any proportional system would almost inevitably lead to coalition government in the small c sense. But the argument that coalition governments are inherently unstable is not supported by research evaluating government stability under different electoral systems across a wide range of jurisdictions. That is, in any event, a pragmatic argument, not a principled one, which should not trump the fundamental principle that each voter's views should, as far as is reasonably practicable, have effect an effect upon the composition of the legislature. Next, I'd like to talk about parliamentary control over the executive. Although in theory the doctrine of responsible government applies in Australia, the system is barely functional insofar as the ability of the opposition to scrutinise the executive is concerned. This is because there is nothing that either House of Parliament can do to compel the executive to provide the information required for that scrutiny. This was revealed most starkly in 2002 when former Defence Minister Peter Reith refused to appear before a Senate committee investigating the Children Overboard affair. And the cabinet ordered that his staffers also not comply with the committee's request to attend. At the time, the coalition lacked a majority in the Senate, which meant that Labour, in conjunction with the minor parties, had sufficient numbers to compel Reith's attendance and could have used their majority to initiate contempt proceedings against him. However, despite the fact that the Australian Democrats and Greens supported such steps, Labour refrained from using its Senate votes to exercise the contempt powers. The most that ever happens when ministers refuse to provide evidence to committees is that they are subject to a motion of censure, and both major blocs are careful when in opposition not to initiate contempt proceedings leading to significant penalties, such as suspension from Parliament, a fine or imprisonment, that could be used against them once they are back in power. This provides yet another example of the negative consequences for the Australian body politic of the Labour coalition duopoly. The most striking recent example of ministerial defiance of legislative oversight occurred in 2013-14 when the then Minister for Migration, Scott Morrison, refused to answer questions posed by a Senate committee on migration matters. Similarly, in February this year, officials from the Department of Immigration and from Operation Sovereign Borders refused on public interest grounds to answer when a Senate committee asked whether the government had paid people smugglers to return asylum seekers to Indonesia. The fundamental problem with this claim of public interest immunity is that there is no test other than the government's own assertion for determining whether the public interest does indeed justify non-disclosure of information to Parliament. How then is this to be remedied? Clearly constitutional conventions have lost their binding force in Australia, and it no longer is satisfactory to leave the workings of responsible government to the goodwill of ministers. The answer is therefore to replace these conventional rules with statutory provisions which would compel executive subordination to legislative oversight with penalties for non-compliance. Obviously, provision would have to be made for genuine cases where the national interest militated against public disclosure. But this would not mean allowing the executive to claim immunity from providing information merely on its own assertion that the public interest required that. Rather, what is required is a set of rules under which one the default position is that there is a legal, not just political duty on ministers to answer questions and to provide such other evidence as is required by parliamentary committees. Two, which allows proceedings to be taken in the courts in cases of non-compliance with an appropriate regime of penalties. And three, which casts upon ministers the onus of making out a defence of public interest at those court proceedings, in camera if necessary. It would also be critical to the success of such a system that the right to initiate proceedings for non-compliance should vest not only in a house and or its committees as a whole, but should also vest in individual committee members. This would be a radical change from the current position. Putting executive accountability to the legislature on a legal rather than conventional footing and making the application of penalties no longer vulnerable to political majorities would have dramatic consequences for the conduct of responsible government. 
Here, the experience of the United States is instructive, where the legislative branch has far stronger coercive measures at its disposal to ensure executive compliance with requests for information. There, long-standing Supreme Court precedent gives Congress the right to obtain information from the executive and to have recourse to the courts to enforce subpoenas against members of the administration. This was most famously demonstrated in cases which came before the Supreme Court during the Nixon era. More usually, however, the two branches reach a political compromise. And it is a quite normal feature of the political process for members of the executive, including members of the cabinet, to appear voluntarily before public hearings of congressional committees or for information to be provided at confidential committee hearings. The fact that the judicial branch is the ultimate determiner of the degree to which the executive is accountable has not led the courts to being confronted with policy questions that they are incapable of deciding. There is sufficient case law for the courts to engage with in determining whether a claim of executive privilege is valid. It is a matter of supreme irony that the legislative branch in the United States has far greater scrutiny power than is the case under the system of responsible government that we have in Australia. Next, I'd like to talk about rights protection. It is a truism to say that the purpose of a constitution is to allocate powers between institutions of the state and to define the powers of the state vis-a-vis -vis the individual. Although our constitution does the first, it does the second hardly at all, as it grants protection to only five express rights. Yet, of course, a constitution is the only document capable of protecting the individual from legislative power. The usual justification advanced for the absence of a Bill of Rights is that Australians prefer to put their trust in democratically elected representatives rather than in the courts. The classic enunciation of this by Robert Menzies was as follows. There is a basic difference between the American system of government and the system of responsible government which exists both in Great Britain and Australia. With us, a minister is not just a nominee of the head of government, he is and must be a member of parliament, elected as such, and answerable to members of parliament at every sitting. Should a minister do something that is thought to violate fundamental human freedom, he can promptly be brought to account in parliament. Menzies' comments reflect a glib fantasy. As already discussed, the executive is not subject to control by parliament. The strength of the party system and the way the rules of parliamentary privilege currently operate serve to make the government a virtual elective dictatorship. Furthermore, Menzies' argument, which is still restated in various forms by opponents of a Bill of Rights, ignores the fact that it is parliament itself that poses the principal threat to rights. As Geoffrey Robinson states, a Bill of Rights means justice for people whose particular plight would never be noticed by Parliament or prove interesting enough to be raised by newspapers or a constituency MP. Far from undermining democracy by shifting power to unelected judges, it shifts power back to unelected citizens. Democracy from its inception has relied on judges, unelected precisely so they can be independent of party politics, to protect the rights of citizens against governments that abuse power. Robinson's point is important. It is precisely because judges are unelected that the protection of rights should lie in their hands, as the issues they would be charged to determine, which in aggregate boil down to the protection of human dignity, are not ones which should be decided through the interplay of party political forces. Furthermore, few seem to have grasped the inconsistency inherent in the argument against a Bill of Rights based on democracy. Democracy, in the sense of an entitlement to political participation, can itself be justified only by reference to an external norm, namely the political equality of individuals and the corollary that each person has a right to participate in the lawmaking process. In other words, democracy is itself logically subordinate to and dependent on the concept of human rights. The absence of comprehensive rights protection from the Australian Constitution is all the more cynical given that Australia is signatory to all the major human rights conventions. And you will search these documents in vain to find an asterisk 
directing the reader to a footnote which says, these rights do not apply to democracies. There seems to be an attitude of exceptionalism at play in relation to fundamental rights, which puts us at odds with the post-World War II international consensus, which emerged in the wake of the Nuremberg trials, and which rejected positivism and called for the universal recognition of fundamental rights by all legal systems. Given that our constitution already grants express protection to five rights, and the legislation inconsistent with these rights can be invalidated by the High Court, it cannot be said that constitutionalization of the full range of rights which we have pledged to uphold internationally would be alien to Australian constitutionalism. Such a step, while expanding the range of rights protected, would certainly not confer any new function on the courts. However, if the existence of justiciable rights is offensive to constitutional principle, then surely opponents of a full Bill of Rights should be calling for the Constitution to be amended to remove such rights as it does protect. Yet calls to remove provisions such as Section 116, which protects freedom of religion, have been conspicuous by their absence. So the question which needs to be asked is, if freedom of religion is protected, why so should that not be in the case of other fundamental rights? The absence of a Bill of Rights leaves the individual vulnerable in the face of legislation which infringes fundamental freedoms. Let me give just a few examples. It puts Australia in the position where there is no express constitutional right to due process, it being a terrible irony that in the very week of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta last year, the principal concern of the government was the drafting of legislation to allow deprivation of citizenship without need to go to court the very antithesis of due process promised by Article 39 of Magna Carta. The absence of constitutional protection of the right to privacy in the sense of personal autonomy means there is no recognition that, in relation to intimate personal choices, and here I'm thinking specifically of same-sex marriage, the individual should be shielded from the prejudices of parliamentary majorities. Similarly, the fact that there is no constitutional provision, prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment means there is no limit to the harshness with which asylum seekers may be treated. I cannot leave the issue of human rights without discussing the constitutional recognition of indigenous people. It is scarcely credible that there are voices in main, mainstream voices in 21st century Australia who are either openly antagonistic towards the inclusion in the constitution of a right prohibiting racial discrimination, or who, while they may support such a right in theory, argue that its incorporation would frighten the conservative horses and thus lead to a defeat at referendum. We are left in the truly bizarre position that the constitution protects the right not to be discriminated against on the grounds of which state one lives in, yet does not offer protection against racist legislation. This is not the time to propitiate conservatives. What is needed is the same moral leadership as was in evidence during the 1967 referendum, which confronts the constitutional conservatives on this issue and overcomes their arguments. We must reject any approach which makes concessions bargaining away the rights of indigenous people even before battle has properly been joined in order to win conservative support for watered down reform. Above all, we need to move away from the idea that consensus is the only basis for constitutional change, a point to which I'll return later in this paper. Sometimes change requires that its opponents be confronted head on and their arguments refuted and comprehensively defeated in the public arena. A commitment to non-discrimination is certainly one such occasion. Now I'd like to talk about federalism. Seen at its best, the adoption of federalism in preference to unitary government was the necessary price of creating Australia as a nation. At its worst, it can be seen as a base compromise, pandering to colonial jealousies, which saddled the country with an unnecessarily complex and expensive form of government, and although I hesitate to say it where I'm speaking today, a second chamber which has never performed its designated function as a state's house. If the federal system is looked at with cold ahistorical objectivity, 
one must conclude that it is difficult to believe that a country with a population, the equivalent of a major city in many other countries, should have nine governments. The economic cost of federalism is enormous. As long ago as 2002, it was estimated that, at an absolute minimum, the existence of the federal system drained the economy of $40 billion per year, a figure which would be now be much higher. This covers obvious costs such as running state and territory governments, costs to the Commonwealth of interacting with the states, and compliance costs to business. It excludes intangible costs in terms of time and inconvenience. Think of simple matters such as car registration or tra trades licensing experienced by anyone who is moved into state. Furthermore, this cost is not balanced by any benefit. It would be idle to pretend that US Supreme Court Justice Lewis Brandis' famous statement that federalism creates circumstances where a state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country operates in any real sense in Australia. It cannot be said that Australia presents a vibrant diversity of so social dioramas. The other supposed major benefit of federalism is that it provides protection against tyranny by diffusing power. But federalism does not affect what things governments may do to individuals, only which government may do them. As I've argued above, only a Bill of Rights can protect the individual's freedom. Defederalization would obviously remove a key rationale for the existence of a second chamber. Yet this would not mean a diminution of legislative scrutiny over the executive, because the enhancement of the powers of committee members recommended earlier in this paper would enable members of committees of the House of Representatives to subject the government to more scrutiny than even the Senate can today. Furthermore, the adoption of proportional representation for the House of Representatives would make anomalous the continued existence of an upper chamber elected under an inherently disproportionate allocation of an equal number of senators to each state, irrespective of population. Finally on this topic, there is already a degree of public appetite for the abandonment of federalism. A 2014 survey of public attitudes by the Griffiths University Center for Governance and Public Policy found that 71% of respondents favored changing the current system, among whom there were differing preferences for the inclusion, um, for the allocation of functions to national, regional, and local governments. And this is consistent with a survey commissioned by the public lobbying group Beyond Federation that same year, which found that 78% of respondents favored having a single set of laws for the entire country. It therefore seems that defederalization is a reform proposal which would be well received by voters. I leave consideration of this issue by posing the following question. If we were writing the Constitution de novo, would we really create this nine government system again? And if the answer to that is no, then why would we now not abandon it? Next, I'd like to talk briefly about the Republic and codification of the reserve powers. I've left this issue until last because although it is the most frequently discussed constitutional reform, it is, in my view, the least important. This is not to say that issues of symbolism are without any importance, and I remain committed to the view that a severing of the constitutional link between the monarchy and Australia would serve to signal Australia's separate identity on the world stage and would ensure that there is no office under the Constitution to which Australians may not aspire. However, of far greater importance than this, in my view, is codification of the conventions regulating the reserve powers of the Governor-General, a step which should be taken irrespective of whether we retain the link with the Crown or abandon it. This issue is, of course, linked to that of a Republic, insofar as significant political capital is made by monarchists out of the supposed risks that an Australian president would abuse the reserve powers by departing from the conventions governing their use. This problem must therefore be addressed if there is to be any chance of a republic, particularly one involving a popularly elected president, which opinion polls indicate is the preferred model. Yet to repeat what I said at the outset, Codification is necessary even in the absence of a move to a republic, as it remains a puzzle 
as to why in the wake of the 1975 constitutional crisis, no attempt was made to do this in order to remove any uncertainty in relation to under what circumstances the powers should be exercised. There is no shortage of examples from the international Commonwealth which could be drawn upon. Several Commonwealth countries have maintained the office of Governor General and the link to the Crown, but have codified the conventions. The same is true of others that have become republics with a figurehead president exercising the same powers as formerly exercised by a Governor General. Finally, one can point to Germany and Ireland, republics whose constitutions are based on parliamentary government and contain codified rules almost identical to those which operate by convention in Australia. I would therefore argue that codification of the conventions would be beneficial in itself as well as being a necessary corollary of a move to a republic. Turning finally to the question which I deferred at the start of this paper, what are the prospects for constitutional reform? In answer to this, I would make three points. First, public opinion in Australia reveals a paradox of extreme conservatism in relation to constitutional change, coupled with disenchantment with and disengagement from the political process. Yet there seems to be a failure to recognize that unless people become accepting of constitutional reform, none of the shortcomings, which are the source of that disillusionment with the political process, can be addressed. Second, history supposedly shows that successful constitutional amendment requires bipartisan endorsement by Labour and the coalition. This has a number of invidious consequences. Only the most unconscientious amendments, which in reality those which have, means those which have the least impact, have a chance of passing at referendum. The perceived need for bipartisan support means that the major political parties enjoy a de facto stranglehold over reform. Furthermore, since the parties, these parties are unlikely to endorse changes that alter the balance of power in the Constitution in a direction that is adverse to their own interests, the capacity they have to derail constitutional reform perpetuates the current political status quo. Why does the public allow this to continue, given their disillusionment with the political process in general and the major political parties in particular? Much of the answer to this lies, in my opinion, in the fact that a lack of civics education puts voters at a significant disadvantage when evaluating constitutional reform proposals, making them easy prey for politicians who exploit ignorance about constitutional matters and stoke groundless fears about the effect that constitutional change would have. In my view, this means that since most of the necessary reforms are antithetical to the interests of, ma of the major parties, true reform will happen in spite of them, not because of them, and that the only hope of achieving real reform lies in mass mobilization of public opinion to an extent which puts the major parties under irresistible pressure to put reform to the people. Third, it follows from the first two points that the key to constitutional reform lies in harnessing prevailing public disenchantment with the political order to whichever reform measure has sufficient populist appeal to overcome the voters' notorious suspicion of constitutional change. In my view, a campaign advocating the adoption of proportional representation might have the greatest chance of success. It has the advantage that its case can be based squarely on the concept of fairness and would be able to draw upon rising levels of dissatisfaction with the major parties, which are so obviously and unfairly advantaged by the current electoral system. Leaving aside this immediate strategy, it is clear that in the long term, constitutional reform depends upon having a citizenry sufficiently knowledgeable about the current constitution and its shortcomings to critique it. Here, the deficiencies in civics education need to be considered. The Commonwealth syllabus, Discovering Democracy, made available in 1997, and the civics and citizenship subject contained in the new Australian curriculum, published during the period 2011 to 13, do a good job at explaining the constitution as it is, but fail to critique the existing constitutional order. We desperately need a new model of civics education which enables students to beco become both informed and critical. 
Finally, academic lawyers, who one would normally expect to be bold in their critique of public institutions and innovative in suggesting alternatives, but who in general who have not done so, also need to discuss broad constitutional reform from the perspective of principle, leaving aside, at least initially, consideration of the political difficulties involved in changing the constitution. But public resistance to constitutional change is seen as being so ingrained that academic writers rarely venture into this area, presumably believing that anything that is truly significant is doomed to failure. This approach sacrifices principle for pragmatics and ignores the fact that meaningful reform rarely occurs by following public opinion. Radical reform is by its nature controversial, and so the role of the advocate must of necessity be that of leading rather than following. We therefore ought not to be daunted by the apparent difficulty of the task confronting those of us who seek progressive constitutional change in Australia today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Harris. Now, who is provoked enough to come and ask a question? Well, come and line up. <laughs> Oh, you, you, can, you can speak from either place. If, if you're comfortable yes. speaking from there, please do. Ernst, you go first. Well, I'm provoked by many issues, but I'm going to focus on one and, in fact, take issue with one of your propositions. Your proposition that there is nothing that either House of the Parliament can do or committees of the Parliament can do to compel the disclosure of information. And I would put it to you that that is simply wrong. Um, let me perhaps reminisce. As a former Commonwealth officer, I've been telephoned on more than one occasion to bring my toothbrush because I might be committed to Goulburn Jail if, if I refuse to answer some questions. Also, as a Commonwealth officer, I have on more than one occasion provided legal advice that the Committee of the Parliament did have the power to compel an answer to a question, mm. and it was a matter for political judgment of the mm. committee uh, whether it wished to compel that. And my understanding is that both sides of politics, on the basis of reciprocity, don't exercise that power because on another occasion they'll be on the other side. Now, your solution was that this should go to the courts. Now, there's a threshold question. Would this be an advisory opinion? Uh, would it be a matter? Would it be something for the courts? But there's also a question, and this is a question I put to you, is how would it go to the courts? Would it be a referral from the committee? And if the members of the committee are so reluctant themselves to compel someone to answer a question, why would they be less reluctant to refer this to a court when the ultimate conclusion would be one they are wishing to avoid? Mm. But uh, that's a very good question. And it really serves to emphasize the importance of the very final point I made in relation to my suggested process. Yes, a public servant can be compelled to attend a committee meeting, but if that public servant's minister tells them not to, um, then it becomes a matter for the minister. And the public servant who declines to attend uh, the minister will usually attend in their place. And the point is that because of this reciprocity, the big stick of, um, in, of um, proceedings for uh, refusal to answer questions is not used. I see this reciprocity, this reciprocity as a great evil. And it was illustrated clearly in the Children Overboard case neither Labour nor Coalition uh, would want to create a precedent that a minister could be dragged before Parliament and in the old case of Fitzpatrick and Brown from the 1950s, a breach of parliamentary privilege exposes you to detention in a dungeon, which I presume we have somewhere in Parliament House. False. Or in, in the ACT <laughs> Watch House. Um, yes. To, 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 to be exposed to that. And it's precisely for that reason that standing to initiate such proceedings 
must be given to individual members of committees. So it's truly revolutionary what I'm suggesting. I'm saying that the jurisdiction doesn't vest in a committee of the House or proceedings of the House to, to, to initiate proceedings for um, a contempt. The individual member can initiate those proceedings. Now, the immediate effect of that would be ministerial compliance in 99% of the cases. And it is only in the cases where there was genuine, provable national interest in not complying, which a case could be made out to court, that there would be non-compliance. It would change the whole dynamic to one of being presumed need to comply, failing which there would be a penalty. Um, and that's, that's, that's the mindset that would change in, in, in the mind of ministers. Um, there was a bill put forward in 1994, I think it was, by Cheryl Kernow, which proposed exactly this sort of measure. And of course, it got nowhere because of the opposition of the major parties. So yes, in theory, and I mean, you can read Odge's Senate practice, and Harry Evans says in that, you know, under the common law, there is an obligation to attend. But for every right, there has to be a remedy. And if the remedy is never used against recalcitrant ministers, because ultimately you have to get the cooperation of the major parties to use it, then there is no remedy. And that's, that's why I'm advocating such revolutionary change. Um, no, I think it would be a matter. I mean, if the legislation uh, which I propose established an obligation, then it would, if a minister was under a Commonwealth statute obliged to answer questions, and under the doctrine of responsible government, I mean, if you look at cases from the New South Wales Parliament, like Egan and Chadwick, there it is said that under the system of responsible government, it is an appropriate, or houses have an appropriate right to scrutinize members of the executive. Well, that I think would give rise to the interest the standing of the individual committee member who had, had fail, failed to have their question answered to get that question answered, and if it isn't, to bring the matter to court, not on an advisory opinion, which of course the courts can't give, but a, a definitive binding opinion. So you, you were next, I think, if you'd like to ask your question. If you're happy to, to wait up the back there, you're next. Thank you. Sorry, I've got an essence, so I'm not, not very stable on my feet. Um, I've lived in three countries. I was born, or four countries. I've lived in Canada. I was born in Canada. I lived for three years in Scotland, which is irrelevant. I've lived in New Zealand from 1960 to 65, and in Australia since then. In each of these three countries, we have indigenous people: the mm. Indians, uh, the Maori in New Zealand, mm. and the Aborigines here. In New Zealand, there was the Treaty of Waitangi with the British many years ago, which is yet to be ratified in the New Zealand Parliament. It seems to me that we are very biased against indigenous people, even though in each case, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, they were the first people in this country. Are we not really unde undemocratic and biased against the people that were, in case I'm a pale face in Canada, I'm a Pakeha in New Zealand, I'm a white man in Australia, which is as close as we can get. But does this not show that, that we all have a bias against indigenous people? I certainly think that there is unfinished constitutional business in relation to the recognition of indigenous people. Now, as we know, um, the, there were a number of recommendations by the expert panel on recognition of indigenous people. And I think that removing um, racially discriminatory provisions in the constitution is, is an important starting point. I think, as I've said in my paper, that you have to have a right to non-discrimination. I would also think, um, and I said this myself in a submission to um, that panel, that you need to have something in the Constitution which recognises the cultural rights of in in Indigenous people. There's actually a very good model for this in Section 19 of the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities in Victoria. Unfortunately, it's not justiciable, but the phraseology of it is, is, is an excellent template which could be used to ensure redress for past wrongs and protection for the future for the rights of indigenous people. Um, I've also written elsewhere um, about recognition of indigenous law. 
Um, when I went to university in, in South Africa, we had to study what was called customary law because it is still part of the law of the country and the courts right up to the um, top uh, court in the country will um, hear cases involving customary law which might have arisen uh, in a headman's court in, in a village. Um, but Australia, um, currently, there is no recognition of Indigenous law, and it's one of the things that I'm very interested in progressing. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr Lang. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Dr Harris. Um, more than half a century ago, in the local degree shop, there was only one at the time, uh, I came across the words, politics purges the system. Now, this place, plenty of politics. Oh. And Dr. Lang is keeping a straight face there. I, I kind of <laughs> uh, the politics of the ivory power, uh, tower, imperfect. The politics of the courts, imperfect. Uh, the politics of the variety of state uh, legislators, imperfect. A whole range of imperfections which conspire against each other, but somehow we muddle through. And what turns out to be, despite the constitution, a pretty jolly good outcome. If I might make uh, odious comparisons with many of the other countries which I've uh, lived or indeed visited, not real bad. So why don't we leave things be? Because I think that the good is the enemy of the best. I don't think, you know, she'll be all right. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, this is phraseology that I just don't think is acceptable. If there are defects in the constitution, yes, it lumbers along. Um, it's like, let's take the example of the conventions um, or, I mean, the, the one principal convention that uh, I'm thinking of is, is that um, the Senate ought not to block money supply. That was one of the contentious issues in the, um, in the 1975 crisis that's still not resolved. We could have the same events happen in 1975. Well, many academics say, oh, well, the solution to that is uh, just don't press the issue. It's like saying, yeah, buy this car, but don't drive it over 70 kilometers an hour or the wheels will come off. I think what we've got to do is aim for the best we can have, not just that which is barely acceptable. You know, we've got to set the bar higher. And some of these problems, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't even go so far as to say the system works. In relation to ministerial accountability, it patently doesn't work. It, in relation to the electoral system, it doesn't give everyone's vote an impact upon the outcome in the House of Representatives. If I was a voter for a minor party in a safe Labour or coalition electorate, I'd feel embittered going to the polls year in, year out, knowing that my vote has no effect whatsoever at all. I don't think that's a functional system. I think that's a system where problems are suppressed, and I think we need to confront them and deal with them. Ricky Buell, Victoria, one wonders. Well, 457 votes. Yes, and the electoral system I am suggesting would, because of the size of electorates, lead to different outcomes. But I, I, it's not for me to say Ricky Muir shouldn't be in the Senate. It's whether or not there is an adequate level of representation of the voter. I'm looking at the voters' power. That's, that's the critical issue for me. And having 2,000 voters one side of a, an imaginary line and 2,000 on a different side, and that being critical to the outcome of who forms government, is just not fair. Oh, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, please come to the microphone. Just on the federal system. Uh, yes. I, I'm not sure where you form your opinion that uh, people would be ready to change the federal system. Uh, uh, I came to Canberra in the 60s, and in those days, Canberra was pretty well the only place where you had a mixture uh, of people from all the states. And what struck me, having come from a smaller state, uh, was, you know, after a few months of being exposed to people, uh, from everywhere, was that the Victorians, the Queenslanders, the South Australians, the Tasmanians and the West Australians, all, when you asked them what they were, they all said they were Victorians, Queenslanders, South Australians, Western Australians, Tasmanians. If you asked people from New South Wales, 
they said they were Australians. Now, um, it's, and having gone back to my home state of South Australia quite often over the years, uh, people very, have very strong identities, state identities, which go right back to colonial days in all the uh, outlying states. And uh, while I think we could reform the federal system, I just don't think it's at all realistic to think we could uh, do away with it altogether. And uh, certainly I can understand, and I still see the difference today. If you're with a group of people who were brought up in New South Wales, they tend to uh, still think of them fundamentally as Australians. And although it's weakened, I think, in the other states, uh, there is still a very strong feeling in all the other, in all the other states. So uh, I think perhaps you're being a, a little uh, idealistic here. And I, I uh, also note that you come from a university in, in, based in New South Wales. Yes. Um, I, I admit quite candidly that I am being idealistic and I, I don't uh, underestimate the difficulty in these changes. Um, as to the basis for my assertion, it, it was those surveys done in 2013 which, um, where people were asked, you know, how many levels of government do you think there should be, which should there be, should there be one making general lawmaking powers and then delegating powers to local government, um, etc. Of course states have and always will um, incite, or I don't know if that's the word, uh, maintain a strong identity in their, in their residence. And there's no problem with that. And those identities can carry on for sporting functions or sporting uh, purposes for anything else. All, all I'm saying is, is that do we want to waste $40 billion a year on having these as levels of government and I, I don't see the rationale for doing that. The identities can be preserved. Um, they won't disappear. But from a political point of view, I question their, their, their ongoing relevance. That's all. Yes. Well, my question is based on the fact of having lived in Canberra and even politically interested for most of my life, and now living in regional New South Wales. Um, the recent hubbub about the uh, amalgamation of councils in New South Wales and some of the uh, violent reactions to it in some areas, does that indicate to you that this um, notion of changing boundaries, of changing the way systems work, is going to be a much tougher job than you would anticipate from the political analytical mm. level mm. rather than at the ground force. And I've just also from an electorate that has just changed, changed boundaries where people have no idea who their new electorate is, they have no idea who the candidates are, and they're not particularly interested. Mm. And uh, I just wondered how you would see that fitting into what I actually agree with what you're saying, an idealistic idea, but you come to your final issue, how do you practically implement it? Yeah, I think that's important and, and raising local government is, is very interesting because in, in these surveys, it showed that there was quite a degree of um, support for the concept of a single national government enacting laws and delegating powers to local and regional governments, which people would then continue to elect as they do now. But there wouldn't be any question of those governments, laws, you know, uh, um, being able, being superior, or the Commonwealth's legislative power be constrained. The Commonwealth would have plenary powers and then you'd have local or regional governments. And there was a degree of support for strengthening the functions that were allocated to local and regional governments in exchange, if you like, for getting rid of the states. And I think that often people identify very strongly with local governments, and you're quite right, the amalgamation issue has, has, has demonstrated that. And that might, in fact, be a positive in a defederalization campaign. So yes, it would be difficult, but I think that would be an important part of it. Okay, any further questions? I, I'm resisting because uh, I'm going to take him to a lunch to lunch afterwards and attack him over lunch. So, uh, 
<laughs> He's got that in store. Um, so if there are, are there any further questions? I'd just like to throw one thing in, mm. in at this point, because you, you started your lecture on this, this theme and we keep coming back to it. And it's the simple fact of geography. Geography matters. And I think it was one of the, the, the triumphs of our um, constitution writers to recognise the significance of, of geography. And in a huge country uh, in terms of square miles and geographical area and a relatively minor population, a, a small population, uh, federalism was the, the model that seemed to um, meet the, the, the demands of, of both the, the, the idea that some states were larger than others and you would have a, 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 the, the population majority represented in the House of Representatives in numerous seats, but you would maintain that equality yeah. across the nation, uh, including recognition of minorities by having the, uh, the, the Senate as a house in which the partners in the Federation were represented equally. And, and I think that um, there is a snowflake's chance in hell of ever letting go that idea of the states being partners, in equal partners mm -hmm. in the Federation. And it's based largely on geography, different communities of interest, different economic, social, physical conditions, uh, and industrial in the different parts of our great, big, diverse nation. I suppose I, I've always approached constitutional law from looking at the smallest unit, which is the individual. And to me, there's something offensive by the fact that if I lived in and was a registered voter in Tasmania and I got on a plane and took up a job in Sydney, my effective voting power in the Senate would be one thirteenth of what it was in Tasmania. So that, that's the first point. The second point, talking about communities of identity, I mean, surely it is the case that the miner or the owner of a small mine in Western Australia has more in common with the owner of a small mine in Queensland than they do with a uh, person who owns a mansion in Mosman in Perth. In other words, I, I think the, 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 the communities of interest um, in, in society now compared to 1901 are more economic based, they may be ethnic based rather than geographically based. Mm. But I mean, I concede to you, of course, the difficulty in this project. What I'm trying to do is, is shine a bright light of principle on, on these issues. Mm. And you've done that very well. Thank and you. I'd like to, on behalf <laughs> all of, of all of us, thank you for doing that today and for annoying, stimulating, <laughs> provoking us. And uh, we've all got plenty to take away and, and think about for the rest of the day and into the future. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking Dr. B. Harris for a terrific lecture. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out on such a horrible day.